My name is Tia Andragetti, and I am Frontier's Innovation Coach and um, Simulation Coordinator. And welcome to our um, NP Week presentation called Creating a Culture of Community Engagement from a Distance. And I'm here tonight with my colleagues, um, Dr. Angela Mitchell and Dr. Vicki Stonegale to present about how we accomplish this at Frontier. So these are our job descriptions here at Frontier if you wanna know a little bit more about us. So tonight we're gonna to discuss some active teaching methods um, and how they are an evidence-based teaching. And we're gonna assess how these me methods could be delivered to students virtually. We're also gonna compare some various teaching methods currently in use at Frontier. And then we're gonna ask you to reflect on how you can make the most of your education while you're here. So just to talk a little bit about active teaching methods, these are methods that um, faculty use and that students should be using to, to best learn the material. There is a robust evidence base that active teaching methods um, help you learn and retain the information longer. Um, and what makes these active is that they're student-centered, student-focused, not faculty-centered, faculty-focused. So there's very little lecture in active teaching methods, for instance. It's more about doing or applying the knowledge that you're getting from doing readings, things like that. Um, active teaching methods allow you to critically think in the moment um, and to experience what it is going to be like when you're actually doing um, this, uh, the uh, actually applying the material when you're out in real life practice afterwards. So you're not just learning the material, but you're also working with the material, you're applying it, you're having um, various exposures to the material, which is also very important for retention of information. Um, and so, you know, when you read the material, that's the first exposure. Maybe when you have a discussion about it or answer some prompts about it, that's your second exposure. And then when you get in an active teaching session, that's the third exposure. And that is what we know is very, very helpful for retention um, and uh, future application of that information. Active teaching um, also involves making meaning of what you're learning now and relating that back to what you have learned in the past and building on those that previous knowledge and experience. And we know as adult learners, you all come to us with a wealth of knowledge and information. And so we want to build upon that and take it further from where you're at. So there's lots of benefits of um, being taught or learning using active teaching methods. Um, the benefits are you get to practice with skills before real live encounters so that hopefully when you do encounter a real live patient, you've gotten over that initial jitteriness or nervousness. You um, have something to draw back on from your previous experience. And hopefully if you're going to um, make a mistake or be less than ideal, you're doing that in the practice session prior to a real life encounter. This would be especially important with something that is a high stakes encounter, but you may not see frequently. So um, to give a, a midwifery example, a patient with a postpartum hemorrhage or um, preeclampsia with a seizure. Um, so she's now become eclamptic to give a um, FNP example, maybe someone with um, chest pain having an acute MI. Um, you may not get a lot of exposure to that or it's kind of hit or miss where you get the exposure, but we can ensure that every student has that experience if we do it and uh, use an active teaching method to give them that experience. Um, while they're in school. We also try to mimic as closely as we can um, what this will be like in real world application so that you are getting the experience now and can pull that forward into future real experiences that you're having. Um, a lot of active teaching methods engage more than one sense at the same time. And that really helps for those of us who um, 
learn better in a variety of different ways. But also, um, if you think back to um, engaging our noses or um, being comfortable with music, we um, sometimes we remember things better when more senses are engaged. So that is our hope. Um, this will also lead to increased retention of the information and it can help you make, feel more confident. Um, if you've had exposure to something, especially something that could be life-threatening for a patient and you've been able to manage that in a situation prior to a real patient encounter, that can really boost your confidence that you will hopefully have that experience um, when you need it in future practice. A big piece of the learning that occurs happens during the debriefing or the discussion after the active teaching method. And I want to challenge everybody to not just think of debriefing as happening after a simulation. Debriefing could and should happen after um, almost all active teaching methods that we use. And this is where you make meaning of the experience and you really reflect back on how you did in, in the moment during the simulation, but how you might want to alter that um, performance in future encounters, or maybe you think and what you did was, was excellent and stellar and you want to um, tuck that away and emulate that in future encounters also. And that's where you make meaning of it. Um, this is where you can make plan for future changes. It should be where you reflect back and, and think about anything that you were not um, comfortable with, you were unsure of during the um, simulation and that should prompt you to want to go investigate that information a little bit more um, before you hopefully encounter this in real life. So it can kind of be a way to check your knowledge and ensure that um, hopefully moving forward, you can brush up on a few things. I would also challenge you, uh, it can be a way to, to study for comps and boards. So if you're um, encountering something and you're not sure a dosage of a medication or an algorithm or um, a definition of something, go and look it up right then. It's probably going to stick with you way more than it did previously because now you're equating it to a real life, um, you know, even though it's simulated, a real life um, patient or situation, and it may stick with you a little bit longer and be there for recall in the future. So there's a lot of ways we can deliver these methods to you um, from a distance. So um, if we think about simulation, uh, we do many, many simulations from a distance. Sometimes we pretend as if you're in the room with the patient and sometimes we pretend it's a telehealth visit because we know in future encounters that you're gonna have in clinicals, you're going to be taking care of both types of patients. And so um, we have trained our standardized patients if you in, are involved in a simulation with that um, to, to pretend as if they're in the room with you and that can be very effectively done. You're gonna encounter some group discussions or projects that are done either in Zoom or Big Blue Button. Um, and you're gonna be sent to breakout rooms where you can work with a small group of the students and then come back to the class and have a discussion. And that's a really great way to work with the material you've been learning, get to know your classmates, have interactions with your faculty during that and feel like you're in a, a live classroom. Um, we have some courses where you work through a case study, um, either as a class live synchronously or potentially even in a small group, and then either bring it to the class um, in a synchronous session or on a discussion board. We have faculty who use Cahoots, um, and that's a tool so you can be qu um, queried on um, knowledge that you have at answering questions and seeing if you um, know the information and it's kind of a fun game-like way to do it where there's kind of a scoreboard and a winner and things like that. So it's a, just another way of applying the information, interacting with the information. We have courses where you might watch a video of a patient encounter and then um, work through the management together. 
So if you're in one of the management courses, that might be um, a, a way to kind of get you to be able to practice the management where um, you're not wholly versed on it yet. So you may do it as a group of students, because of course, then when you get to clinicals, it's gonna be on you to work through that management. And we have a course at Frontier too that does a grand round type of assignment where students prepare a case and they bring it and present it just like in a grand rounds and then all the students and attendants participate in the management. So there's a lot of great ways to get you um, interacting and involved with the material that you're, that you're reading about, learning about um, in the classroom, even if it's a virtual classroom. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Stone Dale. Thank you, Tia. So I am Dr. Stone Gale, and my course is the Primary Care One course, which is the course you'll come into after you do all of your core courses at Frontier in the nursing in the family nursing program. Um, we follow pathophysiology, pharmacology, and physical assessment. And one of the reasons that um, that course follows uh, those courses is because now that really is leading you into managing the patient, and so you need all of that as a background. So we have a simulation in our course that I wanted to talk a little bit to you about, which is um, uh, called the Breaking Bad News. And the objectives for our Breaking Bad News simulation uh, is to analyze the nurse practitioner's scope of practice during the transition of care. And what that means is that the nurse practitioners are given a case and the case is uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but the case um, really is about the nurse practitioner needing to have a higher level of uh, care for the patient because the diagnosis is a cancer diagnosis and we aren't managing that patient. So we have to know how to stay within our scope of practice to be able to transition that care. Also looking at analyzing uh, your own emotions and feelings. So there's intentional effective growth. And it's really important during these simulation sessions, especially one like this one, where you're really giving a, a very devastating diagnosis to the patient, is to look at your own emotions and your own feelings and talk about those and be able to work through those. Uh, the other objective is to practice effective communication in challenging scenarios using principles of patient-centered care and shared decision-making. And those are two big buzzwords right now. Patient-centered care and shared de decision-making are important in all aspects of the patient's management of care because you need to involve them in their care. You need to make sure that you're communicating appropriately with them what their needs are and what your recommendations are, and then have them be able to share in that decision-making. And they have the right not to, not to, to accept those decisions that you have chosen for them in that management plan. And then implementing the SPIKES protocol. And the SPIKES protocol is actually a protocol we use that helps to guide us. It's almost a guideline for delivering uh, bad news to the patient. Next uh, slide, Tia. So you'll eventually need, you know, we don't want to ever have to have these conversations with our patient, but eventually as a nurse practitioner, you will have to have these difficult conversations with your patients. And it's not a fun thing to do at all. It's very scary. Uh, when you, you know, when you get a diagnostic report or lab reports and you have to walk in that room and share this horrible, horrible news, uh, it's very scary and it's very intimidating. It's also a horrible feeling for you, not only to have to deliver it, but for the anticipation of how the patient is going to react to that um, actual news that you're giving them. You might cry, which is okay. Uh, you may not know what to do. You may not know how to act or what the patient's going to act like. And you may not even be able to get the words out that, you, you know, you have cancer. That's a very difficult thing to say to a patient. But this simulation is one that's going to help you to um, just expose you to doing those things. Next slide. So how do we prepare you for this um, actual scenario? So this, this is a scenario of a life-threatening medical condition. So it is a cancer diagnosis that you're giving a patient based on a biopsy result that was done in your office, in the primary care office. And there are um, narrated videos in the course that help you to uh, work through some of this prior to the session. So we have a, a really good uh, video on um, how to break bad news in a very bad way. 
And then we have one on how to break bad news in a very good way. And then we also have one from Grey's Anatomy, which is my favorite one, uh, I think, in that whole group of videos, which uh, Meredith talks about, you know, this is, you are the, you're the face of that patient. Uh, you're the face of that bad news and that patient's family will always remember your face as being the one that gave them that bad news. There's uh, YouTube videos that we have in there. There's um, tools to help guide you. The Spikes Protocol's in there. There's some actual articles that were written on Spikes Protocol and how they were used in breaking bad news to patients. And then we have standardized patients that are trained in this scenario. And the standardized patients that we've been working with for probably close to four years now know this scenario like the back of their hand. And they are very, very good. They know exactly what to do. Um, they know the emotions that we want to see. They know um, some of them are extremely emotional. Some of them stop talking. Some of them start talking. Some of them cry. Um, there's just so many different um, types of emotions and feelings that they're going to show you. And the bottom line is you have to figure out how you're going to handle that. Next slide. So in that scenario, when we, um, when we give you the scenario, we do go into breakout rooms. And I'm going to talk just real briefly before I go into the debriefing about that. That. We do a pre-briefing before the, the situation starts, and then uh, we go into breakout rooms, and, and we put you in a breakout room with, with your own patient in a, in a setting. You're, they're usually in the university setting in one of the examination rooms in the medical department, and uh, during COVID, they were at home, but they're, they're really kind of back in, into that setting now. And we, we let you have that couple minutes with them to introduce yourself to them, tell them who you are, tell them what you're planning to do, and uh, to be able to just start to break that ice with them. You, you know, they've had the, a biopsy done, and then you are going to take the sutures out, and you're going to give them the biopsy report. And that's when your whole scenario starts. And so you do this, it takes about 15 minutes, sometimes 20 minutes to go through that whole scenario. And once you're done, then uh, the, the um, actual standardized patient will leave the setting for about a couple minutes and, and they're writing some information down and they're going to come back and then they do a debriefing session with you. And that debriefing session is very valuable. And that's probably one of the top things that the students talk about is how that debriefing really was impactful for them because it, the, they, they make you understand what you didn't do right and what you did, you know, could have done better. Um, what you did really well and uh, some of the things that maybe they feel that you could do better to work on down the road. And they do a wonderful job on that. And then we do a 30 minute debriefing with, the, with myself, the faculty member, whoever faculty members with you. And with all five of you that come back into the, the actual session uh, in, the, in the big blue button room and we do a debriefing together. And this is where you can uh, really start making the, those objectives come into fruition, where we talk about your own emotions and your own feelings and how you dealt with this. And this can be a very emotional time for some students, especially if they've gone through some personal things themselves with uh, giving bad news to having a, a family member get bad news. And it helps you to realize that not only are you feeling this way, but some of the other students in your class that are in the session with you, they're also feeling that way. So you're not alone and it allows you to open up. It's a very confidential setting. We say what goes on in the BBB stays in the BBB. And so it's a very confidential setting for you to share, you know, did you like the standardized patient? Did you not? Um, did you not like the assignment? Did you did you uh, love the assignment? Whatever your own feelings are, and you know, and if you cried during the session or you really struggled getting the words out, um, and then after we do the debriefing, three days later, you you will have a reflection that's due, and that reflection is really you. It's you giving an uh, giving us an an insight into your own thoughts and your feelings and your per perceptions and your emotions and what you actually thought about the whole scenario. And it's written in, in your own words and how you, you actually feel. And it, it opens the door for you to share the, your own experience and tell us exactly what, um, what you felt during that. And it gives you an opportunity to be very vocal and to say what you feel and to be honest and, um, and to share. Next slide. And that is it for me.
Thank you, Tia. Hi, um, I am uh, Dr. Angela Mitchell, and I am um, a clinical bound team lead. And um, I help oversee our week of simulations that take place on campus. Um, for the past year and a half, though, we have been doing simulations virtually. Um, we just came back to campus this fall term. Um, and so it's been a really exciting time for us. Simulation is what Clinical Bound is all about. And um, how Frontier works is, is that we, you are what we call front loaded. You take all of your didactic courses. And then once you're completing, uh, you've completed your didactic courses, you transition into um, your clinical hours. But prior to going out there and seeing patients face to face, we have a period um, of time. It is a one week intensive um, on campus that, that is your first attempt of pulling it all together. And I specialize in the family nursing program. And so, as you can imagine, pulling everything together um, from the things that Dr. Stonegales already mentioned, your three Ps, PEDS, women's health, um, adult across the lifespan, uh, including geriatrics and psychiatric mental health. And so it is um, a very anxiety producing um, idea for most of our students who come to Clinical Bound. They're very apprehensive. They don't know if they can remember everything, but by the end of the week, they are filled with such confidence that they know more and can do more than they realize. Um, we also do, so some of our simulations, the majority of them during the week are simulations in which we work with standardized patients, but we also do what we call peer-to-peer -peer simulations where you may be playing a variety of roles. You may be the NP who is seeing a patient. You may play the role of the patient. You may be an observer with a specific role evaluating what's going on during the simulation. And by the end of the week, we even have you possibly being a preceptor um, role um, at the end of the week. Next slide. So we really, um, we take the approach of clinical bound that this is a safe place and that we've built our activities to be strategic. So we start out and we really um, focus on the process of clinical reasoning, the decision-making, making a diagnosis and developing a plan of management. And this is what we use all week long, but using simulation experiences to help you develop these skills. Um, we approach sensitive topics like gynecological or external genital urinary simulation. So um, previously referred to women's health or male GU simulations. And as you can imagine, these are often uh, issues that our patients struggle with seeking care for or how they um, how they ask those. So a lot of our students pull from an experience they had with Dr. Stonegale and how do I have different difficult conversations or um, deal with giving patients bad news with the type of diagnosis as you may make. We also have an experience during the week of focusing in on pediatric well child visits. A lot of our students don't have a strong background in pediatrics. And so again, they have lots of anxiety about doing this type of visit, but it's really a great opportunity that they start to think of the concept of family, family theory, caring for more than just the patient there for the visit, but the whole family that's caring uh, for the pediatric patient. We approach special topics such as orthopedic simulations. And this is a great one because there are a lot of hand skills and physical exam components with um, practicing and then applying it to a clinical situation. We focus a lot, um, well, not a lot, but we have activities for common office procedures and not just learning the skill, but then learning how to apply it in a simulation in the management and treatment of a patient. Next slide. So what do we hear from our students? 
they really, the thing that we hear over and over again, and I think I can say this um, for all the simulations I participate in um, Frontier, that students appreciate that it's just a safe place to get it wrong. They're not, ex we emphasize this over and over again. It's really about learning and getting better. And that this is probably the first point in their program. <coughs> Often uh, a student, you know, in your didactic course, you're expected to know the right answer. There's only one right answer on a multiple choice test. But when it comes to the actual <laughs> application of what they've learned, they have realized that there are lots of different ways to manage things. And one way may be better than another. And so for them to try things out, to improve. So they like the time to be able to reflect. So having an observer role, um, it allows them time to think and process and think, how am I going to do this better the next time? And that's the great thing about clinical bound. We don't do just do one simulation. We, um, when we're doing our debriefing, we generally always end with, well, we have clinic this afternoon or we have clinic tomorrow morning. What did you learn from this activity that's going to make you better tomorrow? And so that's what they really like, that they could just go right back at it again and, and see the improvement and growth in a very short period of time, that they could really reconnect. And I think that's one of the um, strengths of our frontier faculty. We really collaborate with one another and we understand what's going on in other courses. And I know sometimes when I see a student struggling or being really uncomfortable, I'll be like, I know that you did a simulation in Dr. Stonegale's class. What did you learn from that that you that you wanted to make sure you did different the next time? And and then they then they have this moment to think about it and they make the connection and they go, oh yeah, I remember that was so hard. I didn't think it was going to be hard, but it was. And that I knew that maybe it was okay for me to just sit and listen to the patient, that I didn't have to say anything. I could just be present. I go, well, you can use it now. So making that connection and building confidence to see somebody start at the week of clinical bound and being so apprehensive, being so afraid, I'm not going to know it. And a lot of our students feel like imposters. How did I make it this far? Why hasn't anybody found out that I shouldn't belong here? And we emphasize there's a reason you are here. You have many skills and talents, and you are going to make such a difference in the population you serve. And when they can get in there and they can practice and they can see themselves getting better over a course of five days and seeing patients, it just really builds their confidence. And that they no longer, so much in our didactic courses, you know, you have several days to work on an assignment. You can like look things up and it take a few hours. But when we're in clinic and we're on campus, students realize I have to think on my feet. I have to have an answer like within the next 15 minutes. And that really being able to develop that agility in your thinking and problem solving and pulling on resources, they love it. And for them to realize I'm not alone because we learn as much from you students and preceptors as you can learn from us faculty. And so really in our debriefings after every activity, you know, we, it's okay not to know and that we help each other figure it out and use resources. And students go, I think I'm ready to go to clinical that I can do this and put it all together. They got to work out the kinks in a safe place before they had that experience. So that leads us to our next uh, type of simulation. So after clinical bound, students start their, what we refer to as their mega course or your block of clinical hours. With, the, with COVID, um, we had to think on our feet too, because many clinical sites had closed, but we wanted our students to keep making progress. So we developed virtual clinicals. It was so successful that we've decided to keep it, even though the majority of our clinical sites are up and running. 
This is a seminar situation where students after finishing clinical bounds will then enter into what we call uh, synchronous simulations, which take place over five weeks. It's a one it's a one day, six hour block, and they complete it once a week for five weeks. And that there is one faculty for a group of eight to 12 students. And that this is often peer to peer simulations where you might be the FNP, your colleagues, the patient, and that you practice interviewing and working through a series. And once you're done, you flip roles so that everyone has an opportunity to have the role of the NP. There is also telephone calls, because what many students don't realize is that a large percentage of your work as an advanced practice nurse is not just seeing patients face to face, but managing all the things that it requires to take care of patients face to face, as well as managing things that don't take place in a face to face visit, such as telephone calls. Um, interpreting labs and radiology and coming up with plans and communication. There's also a standardized patient, what we call a subjective telehealth assessment validation. So we, again, will use standardized patients in which you, um, the student, will um, interview and you are uh, graded or validated on your patient-centered interviewing styles. And that this is an opportunity that the SP can give feedback to the student about how they made them feel, how was their engagement, and then faculty then can give feedback as well about um, the skills that you were able to display. Uh, we also have activities in which we use SBAR. So a part of team steps in improving team communication is using the SBAR format. And so as a student, it's not just about do I know what to do and how to do it, but you're now collaborating with your preceptor. And how do I present my patient and my thinking in a, you know, a very efficient and effective way? Because when you first do it, you're not very good at it. Like any skill, it takes practice. And so we introduce you to this concept in clinical bound, but you get a lot more practice in presenting your patient in this uh, clinical simulation. And students are really at this point in time um, starting to feel um, a little more alone. Because when you're in a didactic course, um, when you're on campus with students, you don't feel like you're so alone in this journey. But once you enter into your clinicals and you're just working with your preceptors, sometimes students start to feel very isolated. And here they can discuss, um, because many students by this point in time have started their face-to-face -face hours. And so they now have a community to come back to when they're doing their simulations and talk about issues with clinical reasoning, how to make a diagnosis, how to communicate with patients, and that we can help each other learn and improve our skills. Next slide. We really are very mindful. I know sometimes we joke with our patient, our students about, you know, we don't just make this stuff up. We really do think about it. And we want to first, we want to challenge you um, because the thing is, if you already knew all of this, you wouldn't be here. And so that we know that when you graduate and you pass your boards, that there's a big hurdle that a lot of students have difficulty, you know, this is just nationally in transitioning to practice, and that people feel overwhelmed by the complexness of our patients. There are a lot of people that we take care of that have a lot going on. And so we have taken this into consideration that every time you have an activity, we build upon what you did last time and we're bringing it together. And we just really focus on this core basic of clinical reasoning. How do you make decisions, making a diagnosis and developing your plan of care? Because we have to individualize care. Just because a point of care tells us what to do, how do I care for the person I'm seeing today? And that's a lot what these simulations deal about in um, this uh, seminar situation. 
that we often start out with kind of, uh, you did an episodic, simple episodic clinical bound, but when you move to this course, they're a little more complicated. We also then, we've already, you've already had an experience about a wellness visit, but now this is a wellness visit in which you encounter a problem you, that you need to address with the patient. How do you manage chronic disease or continue care for someone who has a chronic illness? And what do you do with an uncontrolled chronic disease problem? And then finally, ending our seminar series with the complex patient visit in which they may have episodic and uncontrolled disease, and we have to prioritize our goals and the care for the patient we're taking care of. And that this really helps pull everything together to lead you up to maximize your face-to-face -face clinical hours. Our students have, um, after they've left us, have reached out to give us feedback. And um, what we've heard, these are actual direct quotes from emails. My favorite group work involved role-playing stu the student nurse practitioner and um, practice patient, which created a safe environment to learn how to gather the history of present illness, develop differential diagnoses. I felt more prepared for in-person clinical because of her virtual clinical course, and it was noted. Um, it was noted several preceptors. Thanks for great preparation for on-site learning. I just wanted to let you know that my pediatric preceptor is thoroughly impressed with the caliber of frontier students. She complimented my subjective history taking skills and the organized delivery of case presentations. I didn't realize how valuable the practice during clinical bound and simulation days would be. So now I'm going to take over and um, I'm going to challenge you all to be thinking about this. And if you're listening to the recording of this, I would like to make this active for you. So listening to a recording is a very passive activity. And so how you can make it active is um, don't just let this uh, presentation keep, uh, keep going through. I want you to stop it after I ask this question and I want you to jot down your answers. So as you've heard, we, we've heard about several activities that we have here at Frontier that are simulation based. Um, but remember, I talked to you about, there's plenty of other activities that we do that are active teaching methods that aren't necessarily called a simulation. And so I want you, if you're a student or a prospective student to be thinking, how can you make the most of your um, faculties uh, deciding to have an active teaching method for you at Frontier? How can you make the most of those experiences that you're being offered? And if you're a preceptor or a possible future preceptor for us, how can you help your future students make the most of these experiences? So take a few minutes, jot down your answers, and then in just a minute, I'm gonna go to the next slide and I'll give you some thoughts that we've had on this. So hopefully you stopped the recording there for a few minutes and jotted down your answers. And I just want to give you some of the ways that I thought of that we could do this. But I um, challenge my, my colleagues who are here with me this evening, please, when we're done, if you can think of anything else, please share them. So anytime um, a faculty member offers any type of interactive um, session, whether it's required or not, I would ask you, obviously, if it's required, you need to attend. But even if it's not, I would encourage you to attend any of those extra sessions. Remember, that's another exposure to the content. It's another opportunity to apply the knowledge you're learning, potentially get some questions answered if you're unsure about something. And it's a great way to test your knowledge and for you to use as a way to determine maybe some areas that you're still not as versed on. If at all possible, when they hold these sessions, try to attend them live. It is much easier to be interactive with the content and not um, 
kind of zone out during them. If you can attend live and work with the material than if you're listening to recording. But if you do need to listen to the recording, try to actively listen, just like I encouraged you to do a few minutes ago. So if a question's posed, stop the recording, jot down your answer. Don't even just think of it, write it down on a piece of paper, hold yourself accountable to do that, and then continue on with the recording. I would also highly encourage you to read and come prepared for those synchronous sessions. Again, you could have that first exposure. So you can do the prep material, you can do the reading, that would be your first uh, exposure to it. Potentially you'd even think of some questions or some things you're unsure of or an area that you're not feeling comfortable with. Then come to the synchronous session, listen to your colleagues, interact with them. If they pose questions, answer them. If you have the ability, ask the questions, the things you're unsure of. That's now a second exposure to the material. And then as you go and study for um, an exam or a project that you're working on, that is a third exposure. And that is what we know is optimal. Please take the time after any learning that you do. I don't care whether it's you reading um, a passage in a textbook, reading a journal article, um, interacting with your peers. Obviously during a simulation, we build this into it, but take the time to reflect on what you felt well, what you felt you knew well knowledge wise and anything that you're unsure of. And again, if you can go ahead then and review it right then and there, you're getting another exposure to the material that's gonna help with your retention of that material. I would also challenge you all the way through your didactic program to create some sort of reference book, or even if you put it on your mobile device of um, things that you might want to look up or have access to quickly and easily during clinicals. So if um, certain labs, just you have a hard time getting them to stick in your mind or a particular medication or drug dosage, add that to a, a quick reference so that you can have that as Dr. Mitchell mentioned, um, it's harder when you only have a few minutes when you're in seeing a patient to be able to access resources and pull things up and we want them to be at your fingertips if you need them. I would also encourage you to take a risk during these sessions. You are not gonna harm any of these patients. So if you're unsure of whether the way you're phrasing something or the diagnosis you wanna give, take a risk. Try it out, see if it works. This is the perfect place to be less than ideal and to make a mistake. You are gonna learn tremendously from that. So please don't hold back. Um, give your education your all. And remember that you are our consumer. So you're paying for us to help you learn this material and be a good consumer of your own learning. And so if you're not getting the information in the way that's helpful and you're not able to retain it, how can, he, how can we as faculty help you work with the material more and try the opportunities that we've put in there? That's why we've added them to the course. Um, and so we do know that we want you to have the best recall and retention of this information. And if you're not getting it, please reach out to your faculty. Um, we will try to help you in a variety of ways um, to get and retain that information. And I did write this one in all capitals, and I know we shouldn't ever do that, but I am kind of shouting it, ask and answer questions that are posed during these sessions. It is wonderful when we're leading these sessions as faculty to have the peers answer the questions for somebody who posed one, not necessarily always the faculty. That helps you as a learner know, hey, I did know the answer to that because I was able to answer that question and just know the faculty are there and participating. If you were incorrect and taking a risk and you were incorrect in answering that question, we'll clear it up for everybody. We're not gonna let that erroneous information go out there. So if you're the one who's getting an answer from a peer, you can know 
that you can rely on that information. And so interact with each other, make the most of all of these experiences. So hopefully you've had some time to ponder all of this. I would also challenge you to think of some takeaways that you have from this presentation tonight. And I would ask if any of my peers, I'm gonna put up our reference here while I'm doing this, if any of my peers have any other information they would like to add about um, what we can encourage our students to do to make the most of these experiences, I would love to hear that too. Yeah, I think that uh, you you really hit everything pretty appropriately, but I, I just really want to stress the importance of uh, attending more sessions than you need to attend. Um, you know, we offer probably 50 to 60 sessions in our course that are voluntary, and I historically see the students do much better in their, um, their actual assignment when they've attended the practice sessions. So it's really important and it's for your own benefit because you will, um, you know, you'll learn so much more just hopping in sessions and listening and listening to the recordings and uh, it'll help you to be successful down the road. And I would, um, I, the, what Dr. Stonegale has said, I can't, um, I was at first not a real believer in the observer role in simulation, but after doing it for the past few years, I will say it's probably, um, most students think it's the most valuable experience they had to see someone else doing it and what would they do differently? What would they learn and take away? Um, and that a lot of students find this type of learning very challenging because it's very different than how they have traditionally been educated. Um, I know that I partake in simulations that are very early in um, your program of study at Frontier and students have some hesitation because they're used to what um, I say is, you know, we fill you up with information and you give it back to us. And this is a very different style of learning, but we know that it leads to much deeper learning and more meaning. And so the thing is, is, is that you as an adult learner really have to embrace the role that it is now your job to reflect on what you need to know and take responsibility for it. Uh, your faculty are so eager to interact with you and collaborate um, that it's just not as fun as when students say, Dr. Mitchell, what do I need to know? And um, versus coming prepared with questions, doing your own reflection. Many of these things that Dr. Andergetti has laid out they will serve you well. I almost think it's worthwhile to just print out that slide and have it up in your study space about what have I been doing lately to help improve because it, it is really our own responsibility. And you're engaging on this journey of advanced practice. Um, uh, my colleagues here today, I know what I learned in nurse practitioner school. It, it's all out the window. The, the knowledge has been generated and, you know, turned over. So really what's most important is your thinking. How do you evaluate and analyze and make a decision? It's no longer about, can I memorize the treatment of hypertension and all the drugs? Because it's probably changing in a few months, yeah. but really reflecting on your thinking and being responsible and seeking out your own opportunities. Well, thank you both very much. Hopefully you've enjoyed our presentation to this evening. We appreciate your attention. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.